Jesus. I just wanted to share um, a scripture with you this morning. I woke up really early and the Lord put this on my heart. And it's from Psalm 34. And it says, I will extol the Lord at all times. In other words, I will bless the Lord at all times. Does it say sometimes? No, maybe, maybe today you're not feeling about it. Does it say maybe when you're only when you're feeling good? No, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Anybody in this place ready to give praise to God? And so, Father, we open up our hearts to you and we say thank you. Thank you for your love and thank you for your mercy. This morning we choose to lay anything that is hindering us from serving you or from worshiping you this morning. We ask that you would dwell in our praise this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Here we go.
Hey, before you take a seat, I want to invite you to turn around to greet those that are near you. Say good morning. And uh, you got 60 seconds. 60 seconds, but we just kind of guessed. So way to go, team. You guys are great. Let's give it up for the worship team. They did a great job this morning. Hey, good morning, you guys. Welcome to Sanctuary. My name is Jillian Chester, and I've got a little... Woo! Hey, he was still attached to that, and he walked off the stage. I would help you, but I can't bend over. Um, okay, so I've got a little bit of news for you. Um, let me pull it up on my phone so we can go over this together. So this Saturday, last week I told you guys that it was like yesterday, and, and I lied. So if you're a woman and you went to the ministry center yesterday for crafts, I apologize. Sorry, that wasn't my fault. That's what they told me to say. So next Saturday, um, the 11th at the ministry center, we've got our women's Christmas get together. There is going to be crafts. There's going to be a message. There's going to be breakfast. It's $15. <laughs> Nate keeps knocking things over. I'm so sorry, you guys. I can't like keep a straight face today. It's $15. It's going to be a great time. Such a, I'm so excited that Christmas is starting and we have all these decorations and stuff. So hearing things like this, that they're going to have a Christmas thing for the women is super exciting. So make sure you guys check that out. Um, the night before that, the 10th, that Friday night, we're doing our Jingle Jam here on campus. That is our Christmas party for all ages. It's going to be great. They're going to have, again, just like the women's ministry, crafts and food. And they're going to also do a skit put on by some of our kids. So it's going to be a really great time. That's at 6.30. Make sure you invite your friends, your neighbors, their dogs. I don't know. Invite whoever you feel like. We want to pack this place out that night for Christmas. And then we want you guys, we want to encourage you guys to check out um, Hope City. It's our other campus down in San Bernardino. Pastor Jim is the pastor there. We did a Thanksgiving event a couple weeks ago. We'd love for you guys to come check it out. You can look um, in your worship guide or you can check it out online. But we would love for you guys just to consider coming and visiting. Um, with that, that is our news. I'm going to invite Pastor Jim up right now to speak about the offering. Thank you, guys. Well, you know what? I don't know if you ever go through this. Sometime even for me. I, it, um, I have to change the, my heart in, in, in my giving. And I'll tell you why I say that. Sometimes it's just routine. Sunday morning or Saturday when I get paid, I just text to give. You know, other days I'll just come in and, you know, drop in something. Whereas here at Hope City, drop in something. So I, there's something I need all the time. I need to be on my, my knees and in prayer about it or, or reading. And this time, in this season, just, I, was, I have a, a video at home that I watch every once. It's called The Nativity Story. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Made around 2006. And this scene pops into my mind. It comes from uh, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 10, and it says, And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. When they, had, when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Every time I see that, that movie, I look back and I, and I can see the faces of the the wise men, as they were staring at the baby Jesus, the Savior, God, who had come to dwell with us. And I started to think about, every, about this week, even as I was giving, of who I'm really giving to. It has nothing to do with the church, really. Yes, we give for the work of the ministry, but we're giving to Christ because, as the Bible says, where our treasure is, there our heart is. We can see how we give, not the amount we give, but how we give shows how much we have respect and love for our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you knowing that all that we have, you have given to us. Lord, we give you honor and glory for these things. And Lord, we just, I just pray that we would think about it, that we have a new joy as we give during this season and, and in our lifetime to you. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said.
Hey, give it up for Pastor Jim, Hope City Church. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Hey, I want to welcome everybody here. I'm so excited that you're here. My name's Rod. If you uh, haven't been here before, I'm one of the pastors at Sanctuary. I also want to welcome all the people that are watching online. And I just want to say that we are delighted that you're with us and we'd love to see you sometime face to face. I want to say the Sanctuary Church, we're a church for people that are new to church. Maybe people that didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up in church. And so we love that you're here. If you're new to church, somebody brought you. It's awesome. Uh, so I also wanted to mention, this is echoing, if you could, I don't know what to do to fix it. But uh, so we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 30. If you are able to stand and you can do so, we're going to be encouraging one another by the reading of Scripture. So I'm going to read verse 26, and I'm going to ask you to read verse 27 and verse 29. Reading from the New Living Translation, this is Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 30. It says this in verse 26, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed with words. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose or for them. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. You may be seated. Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you that uh, you brought us here this morning. Pray that you would step into our circumstances in a fresh way. The Lord, that you would work in our lives and everyone here. Thank you, God, that you've forgiven us of our sins and made us right with you. Thank you, Jesus, what you've done that no one else could do. And so, Father, as we turn to your word, I pray that you'd give us uh, an understanding of it with receptive hearts. May the Holy Spirit reveal truth to us, things that we need to know. Thank you for the amazing sacrifice that you made for us that we celebrate this morning when we take communion. In Jesus' name, amen. So, hey, I'm really excited with you to share the scripture, uh, the word that we have here from Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 30. I've given it the title, um, uh, When You Don't Know How to Pray. When You Don't Know How to Pray. I don't know about you, but there's many times where I feel like I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. I don't understand the situation. I don't have wisdom. I don't have understanding, but I just don't know how to pray. So I don't know if you ever feel that, but that's really what's going to be addressed here this morning. And it says this, that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. He helps us in our weakness. And so one of the weaknesses that we have among many weaknesses is we don't have uh, the understanding of how to pray. So when the Bible says weakness, it literally means uh, our incapacity to do something. There's so many things in life that we just don't have the capacity. So the writers of Hebrews said this in Hebrews 4, 5. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. In other words, God being like us, having come to our planet, he understands our weaknesses. So the Bible says that the Spirit helps our weaknesses. It's not saying that, that we have this occasional weakness. Like every once in a while you wake up and you feel weak. It's not saying that. It's not saying that, uh, that once in a while you need God's strength. What it is saying is this, is that you live in a constant state of weakness, and because you live in a constant state of weakness, the Holy Spirit helps your weakness there. And so helps mean is it's in a present tense. It means it's ongoing. It's not like he helped us yesterday or he's going to help us tomorrow. But he's an ongoing, moment by moment, helping us in our weakness. And so what this is saying is this. There's ongoing help and that the Spirit keeps on helping our constant state of weakness. Aren't you glad to know that? I mean, isn't that good? And so this is how God operates uh, with us. He's 24-7 helping us our weakness. And so I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, patterns of life, habits, I rely on my own strength. I just got to admit that to you. 
that uh, I, had, I will rely on my own way of doing life, of meeting the needs of life, of addressing perhaps issues that I'm facing there. And then when I hit the big ones, I will, I will call out to God. But I'm often inclined to think, yeah, I've got this handled. I've got this figured out. I know how to do this. As if Jesus said in John 15, 5, but because he didn't say this, that without me, uh, you can just do your everyday life. But when you hit the big things, the really big things, then you call on me. He didn't say that. In fact, what he said was, hey, bro, apart from me, like, you can't even do anything. You can't do anything apart from me. Paul put it this way, admitting his own weakness, admitting his own uh, limitations here, that he needed God to strengthen him. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said this. But he said to me when he, uh, he sought the Lord three times, said, God, would you heal me? Uh, would you take away this thorn in the flesh? This uh, Somebody like, it feels like Satan is buffeting me. Would you heal me? And the answer was no, because my strength is sufficient for you. And he said this. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and here's why. For my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect. Here's the point. My power is made perfect in your constant state of weakness. So that's why he would say this. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. So what he's saying is this. I recognize that when I admit my weaknesses, uh, uh, that is when the power of Christ rests upon me. So I'm going to be all about admitting my weaknesses because when I'm self-sufficient, when I'm relying on my own strength, it's sort of like God takes a back seat and says, okay, Rod, you think you can do it? Go ahead and figure it out. So Paul here is communicating that we live in this constant state of weakness, and therefore we are in constant, a constant need of God's help. So he says we have weakness in many ways. But then he gets specific and addresses the area of prayer. He says, but when it comes to prayer, he says, we are also weak. Now, why is that? Why do you think in the area of prayer you would be weak? I mean, do you always know what to pray? Do you always know how to pray? Do you ever lack wisdom in what you're going to pray? Do you ever, like, get tired and maybe fall asleep every now and then? Come on, somebody. And so... Uh, you don't. You can't figure out, is this situation, is it good, is it bad? I mean, is this the kid that, is this the person that my kid is supposed to marry or not? Is this person supposed to be in my life? Uh, what is this relationship supposed to look like? What does the future look like? We don't know the future. And so there's so much that we don't know. And so the Holy Spirit then steps in. Our weakness extends to our prayer life is what he's saying. So helping us, constant, uh, present tense, all the time helping us because all the time we need help. I love this, and this should encourage us, friends, because really it's taking the pressure off of prayer. When you stress out about knowing what to pray for, the Bible is telling you, look, the Holy Spirit is going to come and help you when you don't know how to pray. Let me read this again, verse 26, and you can look at it on the screens again. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So the Spirit is helping us in prayer. What an encouraging word, because I, the speaker here this morning, have an inability to pray, an inability to know, an inability to foresee how I should pray, and so there's situations we face, situations you face. I don't know what to do. People ask me to pray all the time, and there's many times I think, Lord, help me, because I really don't know what to pray here. But the Holy Spirit, in some of your translations read, intervenes for us, okay, intervenes or intercedes, helps us, and it literally means this. This is what it means. When it says helps us, it means to join the burden. Not take over, but join the burden. So a couple of months ago, I was at Lowe's and then Home Depot, and twice I had burdens trying to put some stuff into my truck. In fact, that fan right there was one of them that I was at, that you see right there. I was I was at Home Depot trying to load that into my truck, and I was tr having trouble loading it into my truck. 
and I, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm trying to figure out, like, those, uh, those things you tighten up, you know. I didn't know how to figure the thing out. And so I'm trying to tighten it down. I'm lost. And somebody says, Rod Collins. Like, where have you been all my life? You know, it had been like years. He says, do you need help? Yes, I need help. And he was sharing the burden. Another time at Lowe's, I'm lifting those big four by eight uh, pieces of plywood, and I can't get him. Some guy says, do you need some help? I'm like, yes, please. I, I obviously need help. What were they doing? They were sharing my burden. They didn't take over for me, where I just stood back and said, yeah, go ahead and do it. No, we were together sharing the burden. That's what the Bible's saying here, that the Holy Spirit will share the burden. We don't know how to pray for, but the Holy Spirit shares the burden of our not knowing how to pray. In other words, he's unburdening us in our prayer, not leaving us on our own, to have to figure it out. So that's what it literally means here, joining our birth. He's lending a hand, the Holy Spirit, coming to our aid, seeing that we're having difficulty, seeing that we're maybe distressed there. So this is the idea, the Holy Spirit coming along you to join your burden in prayer. And so when you pray, there's the Holy Spirit with you carrying the burden. Isn't that awesome, friends? It's awesome. And so... Uh, would you agree with me, though? Would you agree with me that you face constant situations that you don't know how to pray about? Would you agree with me? I mean constant. I face, pro like, I, just about every day. I was trying to analyze it, and I think just about every day I face something I don't know how to pray about it. And so why is it then that we need the Holy Spirit's help? Because there's the limitations of our human brains. Would you agree? There's a limitation. There's a limitations of knowing the future. There's the limitations of a human perspective. I have, I have a couple of family situations which are a bit, if I could be completely transparent, are a bit uh, daunting to me. They're daunting in how to address them, daunting in how to figure them out. Um, I'll say this much. One of our family members was borderline hopeless. And I'm having to decide from week to week, whether or not to let them go homeless or to pay for them to be in ho a hotel another week, or another couple of days. It was that daunting. You know, like it, uh, you know, it's been years and is a, I'm, like, I'm like feeling like done with the thing. But situations like that, I'm like, what do you do? And so uh, we don't know exactly sometimes what the need is. We don't know what's the wise thing to do. We can't see the future uh, because sometimes we can't even figure out the present. And so we need help. Uh, we sometimes don't even know, like, what would be the good for us to do there. And so uh, we're going to run from suffering. We're going to run from pain. We're going to run from everything that's difficult. We're going to run from circumstances that we just want to go away. So they just want to hit the fast-forward button. Maybe God doesn't want you to do that. Maybe God has something for you to learn. And so sometimes we pray. And does anybody pray selfishly? Come on, somebody. You're just going to pray what you want. It's true. Thank you for that resounding response there. Uh, it's true of all of us, and two people are willing to admit the truth. Thank you. And so, but we just pray for our problems to be removed, just that they would go away. Sometimes we need help because, friends, like I shared, the problem is so complex, so daunting to you, and you're, you're feeling distraught over the whole thing. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit then steps in, to our situation, comes along, unburdens us, shares the burden there, and the Holy Spirit who knows, we can next verse, exactly what the need is. Now, sometimes you don't even know how to pray. You, you, don't, even, you, like, you don't even have words for it. And so it says here, sometimes with groanings, groanings here, uh, maybe you don't even have the words. I can think of times in my life that I'm not going to share, but they were just like, this was true where I didn't have the words. It was, it was sort of beyond normal words. You, did, you know, it's like wordless communication there. And, uh, but the Holy Spirit can just take those groanings and, and join us in our burden there and help us to pray the very will of God is what this is saying. And so God who understands the whole scope of our weakness there in prayer, not just the frequency of our prayer, not just the manner of our prayer, but our very human nature, which limits how uh, our prayers come to expression. And so 
Some of the ways, friends, that I think that the Holy Spirit helps you pray are the following. Number one, He may place a burden on your heart to pray for someone or something. A burden where, where God is like laying that on you and, and you feel like you need to, to pray about that. Another way that prayer helps us is that prayer can actually build you up. can actually build you up. The Bible says in Jude 1.20, it says this, Build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And so, see, the Holy Spirit helping you to pray builds you up. How great is that, friends? We all need to be built up, don't we? Come on, somebody. We need to be built up. And so another way is that uh, you just simply ask God. This is what I'll do often. I'll say, God, Lord, I just, I don't, ha I don't know what to pray for. I, I don't know what to do here. Just ask God to give you the wisdom and the insight to pray. So now let's look at verse 27. It says, And the Father who knows or searches all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us, or some of your translations read, intercedes for us, okay, in harmony with God's own will. How great is that? How great is that, friends? How many people struggle with knowing the will of God? Come on. Don't, how many people struggle with knowing the will of God? So often, we don't know the will of God. Well, how are you going to pray the will of God when you don't know it? Well, the Spirit joins us, steps in with us in harmony with God's will here. And so, friends, um, I pray for people, and sometimes I don't know what to pray, and I just may be praying Rod's will. I mean, it's just an expression of Rod's will. But this says here that this can, we can pray God's will. So the Holy Spirit steps in, intervenes, or intercedes for us so that we can pray God's will. It's awesome. The Spirit knows the perfect will of God, and therefore can relate that to your, to your prayer life. So the bottom line is this. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is we should be encouraged. We should be encouraged to pray because the Holy Spirit helps you in all your deficiency. Everything that you lack, he makes up for you. And so this should encourage us. So now let's look at verse 28. So here's how you know that all things work together for the good. It says this, and we know. That God causes everything to work together for the good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. So this is a mega awesome coffee cup scripture on the fridge. You know what I'm talking about. One of those that gives us great news here. And so it says, and we talked about this last week, and all the messages are online for free forever. You can check it out. But since uh, we're going through this passage, I'm just going to uh, just... Talk about it just for a few minutes here. So we can know beyond all doubt that every aspect of our lives is in, God, is in God's hands. We can know that. So if anything goes bad, if anything goes hard, we like to be reminded of this verse, don't we? On one hand, you like to be reminded. But I don't like to be reminded of it too much. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't like to, you know, get the email, the text. Then somebody tells me, the next person you know, I'm ready to punch him at that point. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm having a rough time. Come on, you've been there. I Like, I've had it with hearing about this verse. Like, you want to punch him and say, like, and that was for your good, all right? That was for your good. Touche. Take that. Give me all your scriptures. I'll give you the scripture back. So, but sometimes when I'm in a pit, you know what I'm talking about? When you're just having a bad season there, uh, I don't want you quoting me this verse. I already know the verse. You don't have to quote it to me. And so, but it's saying this, it's saying that everything that happens to us ultimately in the end is good. Okay, so, but all things don't work together for the good for everyone. There are limits here. Sometimes there's suffering and loss and brokenness and darkness and pain and worse, but it's outside the limits of this verse. There's a circle around this verse that it only relates to those that are inside the circle, and those inside the circle are, one, they love God. They're God lovers, and number two, they're the called according to his purpose. And so this passage is saying that no matter what happens, no matter what takes place in your life, if you're in that circle, then all things work together for the good. But if you're not, they don't. And so God is at the center of the promise God is working all things here. God is perpetually 
working all things. Though we can't see it, though we can't feel it, God is present, tense, always working all things for your good. And so God is saying this, tell them I'm for them. Tell them I'm going to bring all the issues unfolding in their life to their ultimate good, though they might not see it or feel it today. Yep, that includes all the pain and all the problems, all the disappointments, all the struggles there, all the sin and failure. Yeah, all of that is included in this. All things means all things, and that's all that all things mean. And so no limits. There are uh, no exceptions here to the all things. It's an awesome promise, friends. It's absolutely all-inclusive here that regardless of the extent of the issues of your life, regardless of the intensity of the issues of your life there, no matter whatever overwhelming disappointment, it is for your eternal good. You mean all circumstances? Yes. All trials? Yes. All troubles? Yes. God has a way of taking them, though. They're individually not good. Individually not good. But God then, synergistically, he works them together, individually not good. Remember last week, we, died, we, we had our panel of experts, second service. It was awesome, guys, barfing on stage and things, you know, I had them eat salt and flour and raw eggs, sticking their hand in there, tasting it after a while. Kid here is barfing on the stage. Anyway, there's things in your life that they want to make you barf, okay? They are not good individually, but in the end, you mix those all together, and I pulled out the cake, you know, remember that? Pulled out the cake. In the end, it's good, but individually, not necessarily good. Did anybody see that last week? And did you enjoy that? Come on, somebody. All right, so if you in isolation, there's things that happen to our lives that ultimately we go, that's not good, that's not good, that's not good, that's not good, and you're right, they're not good. But in the end, ultimately, God will work them together for the good. That's what it's saying here. God is a God who weaves together all the elements of your life and in the end ultimately makes them for good. But we look at the landscape of this lifetime and God is looking at the landscape of eternity. He has your eternal good in mind. I talked about, friends, the banner over us is one that reads, God at work. Okay, in the midst of all the trials and tribulations, God at work, providentially orchestrating behind the scenes your own good, overarching eternal purpose for your good. So how is God at work for your good? Well, friends, sometimes we don't know. Like, we really, like I don't know, but I do know this, that spiritually he's working all things together for the good. Okay, for your spiritual development, we're going to read here that you'll be uh, shaped in the image of Christ. And so that's spiritually for your eternal good. It's good from God's perspective. Don't say good from your perspective. It might, be, it might just absolutely stink from your perspective there. It's good from an eternal, godly, spiritual perspective. And again, that the promise is limited to those who want love God. They're God lovers. It's in the present tense, ongoing. Not that you're perfect and all but that you, the general direction of your life is that you love God. And then it says this, it says, and those who are the called, that means summoned, like being summoned to a banquet, called, wooed uh, to, to God himself, to those that are called according to what? Your purpose? So you want to live for your purpose, don't you? I want to live for my purpose. I want to have it my way. But it says you don't live according to your purpose. The promises to those, watch, who live according to his purpose, his promise there. And so what is it this, is, this is what it's telling me. And I feel that this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. It's telling me this, that my life is not my own. Think about it. We want that promise to be true. Oh, yeah, I want everything to work for the good because uh, that's how I want it to be. But do you want this also to recognize your life? It's not your own. Think about that. That's what the promise is saying, that to those who say, my life is not my own, because I'm called according to his purpose, not my purpose. It is not mine. So see, the life that I'm living 
then reflects this, that I've been called according to a purpose, to God's purpose. It's not my purpose. And I will tell you that the purpose that I am now today living uh, is not something that I would have lived before Christ rescued me. I had my plans. I had my purpose. God had another purpose and plan for my life. How about you? Are you living according to his purpose? Now, verse 29 and 30, of these last couple of verses are pretty awesome too. They're all awesome. But in a sense, I just want to say that God stands back from time there and sees all of human history. The Bible says our lives are spent, a whole of our lives as a story that has been told. From the beginning to the end, a story that has been told. God doesn't wait for anything. He lives in an eternal now. Now past, now present, now future. Unto him who was, is, and is to come, the Almighty. God sees it all at the same time there. So God speaks to us outside of the confines of time. And sometimes God will step back from the confines of time there and speak to us from a point of timeless Ness. And that's what verse, with that background, I want us to see verse 29. It says this, and let me back up. How do we know that God works all things together for the good? Here it is, verse 29. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now I need to say that there are different camps and People get really, really into their camp, and they stake their flag down about their camp. And I'm not even going to identify what those camps are. I'm just going to unpack this uh, without bias, okay? I'm going to unpack it without bias. So what it says here is God knew his people in advance. That means that God foreknew, some of your translations read, foreknew, meaning he knew ahead of time. He knew you ahead of time. Knew you before you ever on the earthly scene there. Paul wants us to see this, that your salvation started in eternity past and extends uh, in eternity into the future here. And so God foreordained to set his love upon you uh, so that you'd enter into a relationship with him. Now, we always have to couple Scripture with Scripture. God knew in advance. God set his love upon us in advance so Ephesians, we've talked about this, Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you've been saved by faith, and not of yourselves, nothing you could ever do. Faith was a gift so that you would believe God would have to give you that. And so uh, the faith to believe is even given to you by God because in your natural state here, it says when you were dead and your trespasses is in your sin, how can a dead person ever respond to God, so God has to, to call you there. Uh, the Bible says in Romans that when we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins, uh, about verse 5 says, God made us alive when we were hopeless. And so that's the, the, the overarching kind of picture, and we could spend a long, long time talking about this, but God in his foreknowing, his love for me, predetermined a couple things for me. Here it is, that he chose them to become like his son. That means that God's hand is like never off of me, chose me, his hand upon me, like the potter's hand on the wheel there, that word picture, that's what's like God's hand upon you, smoothing the edges, calling you, conforming you, shaping you into the image of his son there. And then verse 30 says this, and having chosen or predetermined, them, he called them, summoned them to, to him, and having called them, he gave them right standing with himself, and having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So he called them. Number one, he calls you. This is sometimes called the golden chain of salvation, people like to call it. So he called them, okay, so God summons. Remember the word picture is being summoned to a banquet. Imagine a king with a banquet. And he's summoning the subjects to his banquet. You only come because the king is summoning you to his banquet there. And so God calls us. What this is saying is God calls us in so many different ways. So think about your own story. We all have a story about how God calls us 
And I just want to give you a little bit more of my story about how God called me. So this right here is a picture of my mom. That's my mom, Loretta Roberta Kaiser. She was a, 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 in the lineage of a very wealthy Kaiser, who Kaiser Steel and all that. That was her father. So she's very, uh, she grew up in a very um, privileged home, had multiple homes across America, three uh, large estates across America. That's where she grew up. She ended up settling in uh, Arcadia. And so my mom, you know, she was voted most likely to succeed, best personality in the high school. She was the prom queen, the homecoming queen. She was the queen of the Los Angeles County Fair. She was, she, she was like that person, you know what I'm saying? My dad said there was no way I could ever touch your mom. I could ever get close to your mom. She was so, like, renowned person that I had to get to meet her girlfriend, and meeting her girlfriend, that's how I got to your mom. That's pretty smart, I got to admit. That's pretty smart of my dad. So this is my mom, and you would think, man, her kids are going to have a great life. Well, in that picture, there was the seeds of alcoholism in my mom. And in that picture, my mom was sneaking alcohol when she would go on dates with my dad. And years, just a few years later, my mom was a full-blown alcoholic. She was bipolar. And when I was 15, and you'd think like, man, this is going to be a good story. The story turns there. And when I was 15, I was living on my own. My mom was, had to go into... Uh, uh, she had to go into institutions, and she would be in them for, for long periods of time. And for the rest of her life, actually, she had to be in some kind of, uh, some kind of institution for her alcoholism and for uh, her bipolarism for the rest of her life. And you would think that, I think, when you saw the picture, you think, oh, that's going to be a great story. That's gonna, look at that. It's going to be a great story. But, and, you, and you think, like, well, how is all things working together for the good to those that love God? Like, how does that story, what good is in that story? Alcoholism, bipolar, institute, what good is in that? Here's the good. Next picture. So, remember, I'm living on my own when I'm 15. So now, that's me on the left, by the way. How's that look? Do I still, how, how much have I changed over the years? So, <laughs> I'm having a good time. So, uh, so but watch. Collins. Conjulier. That's Dale Conjulier. He became, because I moved, I met Dale Conjulier. Dale Conjulier was like the pastor of the school. We, be, we became lifetime friends. I'm at zero point spiritually. I've never been to church one time, one time on my own that I wanted to go besides a little thing, Catholic thing once, but I've never been to church. And I meet the pastor like of the school, Dale Conjulier. And he takes me under his wing. See how all things are working together for the good? Picture what? Now watch. So Dale Conjulier then takes me under my wing. He invites me to church. I'm, I'm not ready to warm up to church yet. I'm not ready for it. But it was a little different for me to go to church. But uh, really different, actually, for me to go to church because I'd never been. But put the picture back up of Dale. And so, but Dale would invite me to church. Dale would encourage me. Dale would share with me scriptures. And uh, it was like, all of a sudden, like this pastor guy is in my life. And his brother was a pastor, a youth pastor. And then his, his brother uh, also put his, uh, took me under his wing. And then if that's not enough, right? So this is, this is out of the yearbook. There's somebody else that I'm sitting next to in art class who I'm thinking, you know, I need to get, I need to, get to know this person a little bit better, okay? Next picture. So this one here is Debbie Danielson sitting next to me in art class. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, somebody. So I'm thinking I need to get a little more information about this person here. She's the most spiritual girl in the school. She goes to prayer meetings in high school. I say, what are you doing? She goes, I'm going to a prayer meeting. I say, what's a prayer meeting? She says, well, we pray together. I mean, you, I said, you pray out loud? I said, I said, you pray out with other people and you, you pray out loud to God? She goes, yeah. And so guess where she invites me? She invites me to Forest Home. I go to Forest Home camps. You want to go to, come to the camp? I'm like, 
of course I want to come to camp. Like, I'm, I'm all about camp. Yeah, like, come on. Like, yeah, I'm ready for camp. And so I'd never been to camp. I didn't know what camp was, but I'm ready for camp because she invited me. So next thing I know, I'm at Forest Home going to camp, and I'm hearing about Jesus. And I, I remember be, being at the camp and thinking, I think Jesus is real. Like, I think there's something to this. And so it's, and I'm starting to connect the dots. For whom he foreknew, he also called. All things, all things, my mother's tragedy. Come on, friends. I end up going to a school where the most spiritual guy, the most godly guy, and the most spiritual godly girl in the whole school are on both sides of me. On both sides of me. See how good God is? So God working, there's God working, his plan. And so all of us, just another little bit of more of my story. You haven't heard that part of the story, have you? So anyway, there's more to the story for another time, but that was enough for today. But God took me, friends, watch. Go back to my mom. My mom. There was, there was nothing but chaos. Chaos beyond, there, there's words, there's things I can't share with you, that, things I never have shared with my wife that I just can't share. The levels of chaos there. God lifted me out of that and lifted me an hour away to what I showed you to, De, to Dale Congelier and to Debbie Danielson. There, go to Dale now and Debbie. There's Dale and Debbie. And, um, and so completely changed my life, how God used them. So that's what God does. He puts people like that in your life. So that's what it means. And I close with this. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. Having called them, he gives us right standing, not by works of righteousness that we have done, Titus 3, 5, but by his mercy, he calls us. Not by anything that we could ever do, but by his mercy. And so he called them, gave them right standing with God. All of your past passed away. All things become new here. And so this is what God, God shows his love for us. And that while we were ungodly, we were the enemies of God, God made us right with his son. God sent his son, Jesus. And so, and then finally, he brings us to glory. Having then given them right standing, he gave them glory. Notice there's nothing about you there. Where are we in the text here? I'll tell you where we're at the text. Uh, we're nowhere. We're, we're batting zero. We've not even got to the plate yet. Watch. He called. He gave right standing. He gave them glory. See, this is the plan of God. And then finally, and he gave them glory. The plan of God, the purpose of God, the intention of his will is this, that he ultimately brings you to glory. God chose you. Not that you just would bump along forever there, but ultimately to bring you to glory, to pour, to pour out the surpassing riches of his grace upon you. And that, friends, is the end of the message this morning. And next week, come back next week. Please don't miss it. We're going to begin on the next verse. Romans 8, 31 through 39. It is absolutely awesome. I hope that you will be here. Let's pray. Yeah, go ahead. Give, let's give the Lord a hand clap. And Father, thank you for this morning, and thank you for your word. Uh, it's just awesome. It's just awesome. It encourages us. It inspires us. It lifts our hearts. Uh, it changes our disposition. Uh, it changes our trajectory. It, uh, it points us to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, that the Holy Spirit helps us when we don't know how to pray. That you call us, that those who he foreknew, he predestined to be shaped to the image of Jesus Christ. And this we know, that all things work together for the good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Father, we pray that you would work within us, that you would do this and you would do more in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you would stand to your feet. And keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. you're a God who, who you're always turning your face towards us even we're, when we turn our faces away from you. And so this morning we're going to conclude with taking communion and you may um, if you are have never taken communion this is for those that um, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus on the night before his death he was with his followers and he held up bread and he said this he said this is my body which is which is broken for you take this and eat it as often as you do this you remember what I'm doing for you and then he took the cup and he said this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood represents that my blood will be spilled for you he says and often as you drink of this cup you do so understanding that your sins have been forgiven but for the remission of your sins and so let me just add to that about communion, that communion is something that we partake of together. And Jesus instructed his, for his followers to remember his sacrifice on the cross, okay? That he died for their sins on the cross. And uh, you think of, he called himself the bread of life, that Jesus satisfies every need that, uh, that, you, that is left empty by everything that the world promises you. So communion then, it doesn't promise you, it's not uh, uh, you, you do communion to be saved here. You recognize that, you recognize that, good job, Collins, I dropped the communion cup here, friends. So thank you. Thank you. And so when we take communion, we're remembering what he has done for us. And so communion remembers how Jesus gave himself completely for our sins, for a new life, for a new start, for a fresh relationship with God. And so let's take the bread together and remember his body broken for us. And let us drink of the cup. Father, we thank you that you went to the cross on our behalf. And because of that, we have right standing with you. We can be right with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you, you're like me, that, that person that never experienced what God was like, what Jesus was like. And if that's you and you want to say yes to God, you want to say yes to forgiveness, you want to say yes to a relationship with him. You want to say yes to being right with God. Or maybe you've drifted and you need to come back and you need to acknowledge today that you want to be right with God and renew your relationship with him. If that's you, we're not going to embarrass you with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. So I ask you to raise your hand so we could pray for you and, uh, and, and pray over you. In the back, is there anyone else on the side? So Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. You are the God that makes us right with you. And those who raised your hands or those that did it, you need to pray this prayer. Pray a simple prayer, receiving Christ. Pray this. Father, thank you for what Jesus did for me. I receive his sacrifice, dying on the cross. Forgive me of my sins and make me right with you. In Jesus' name, I take you as my Savior. Amen and amen. So if you want to put yourself in a position to receive God's blessing, Father, as you see your children with hands extended, hearts extended toward you, I pray that you would meet them this week. 
I pray your hand upon them. I pray that you would bless them and strengthen them, that you would help them in their prayers, that you would unburden them by joining their burden in this week, that they would know that you are the God who is with them and doesn't ever forsake them. Father, I pray that you would do this and you would do more. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. God bless you, friends. See you next week.